Okay, welcome back from that short break for the final session. Uh, my name's Adam Sibi. I'm the president of DANA, the Drug and Alcohol Nurses of Australasia, which of course you're all members of, right? <laughs> Excellent. And I'm here to introduce Dr. Teddy Anarox, our final speaker for today. She's a research fellow and head of translation and education at the Food and Mood Center Impact at Deakin University. Dr. Rox has extensively, or sorry, is extensively involved in education and training of professionals and community on the topic of nutritional psychiatry and is regularly invited to speak at academic and professional events. Accredited practicing dietitian, Dr. Rox, also leads several research projects exploring the relationship between diet and mental and gut health including investigations in individuals with eating and post-traumatic stress disorders. I'd like to introduce Dr. Tediana Rocks. Is this microphone quick, Teddy? Yeah. Um, let's have a go without microphone. Can everyone <laughs> hear me? Yeah. Usually yeah. people have no issues hearing me. And Zoom people can hear me? Zoom people, can you speak up? <laughs> you at home? They're all gone. Yes, they can hear you loud and clear. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I'm so excited to speak to people in person. I'm sorry you keep hearing this, but I usually do a lot of presentations, and it's only my third presentation face to face this year. So it's just amazing. I do, I'm Zoom out, so I do Zoom all day, every day. So it's just so good to see people here. Thank you very much for introduction, Adam. And thank you for the invitation organizers, Scott and Julia, and for your patience and work to keep reorganizing all this. Hey, we, we all organized events, so we know how difficult it is. So well done. So I'm here to speak to you about food and mood. Yes. Yay. So it's a bit of thank you. That's what I like. That's the reaction I kind of speaking. So it's going to be a bit about everything. So I thought, look, I wasn't sure how deep to go into the topic. So I thought I'll talk about everything. And then if people want to hear more, I'm here to answer questions or come back and see you all in person again and get deeper into different sub layers here. So I'll start with a bit of diet and mental health, talk about the links, what we know, what we don't know. I'll talk about biological dysregulation and comorbidity. What, why do we think diet and mental health are actually linked? I talk about diet in treatment of mental health disorders, and I talk a little bit about issues in implementation. So I hope today the presentation is gonna be useful for you as professionals, but also as um, human beings. So two things to mention here, first of all, Hats off to all of you, because just sitting here and listening to what are you working, that challenging cases you're working with, it's absolutely amazing. So thank you so much for working with people you are working with every day. I feel very sheltered and privileged in my life. Another thing I want to mention, when I say what diet, it doesn't mean, so it's, I don't want negative connotations with diet. It's not about guilt. It's not about thinking, I don't know, all this stupid stuff, COVID killers or some, that's <laughs> not about this. So when I say diet, I actually just mean way of eating, what people consume and drink every day. So when I talk about dietary style, it doesn't mean that I want to put myself, God forbid, or anybody else on a diet or start radical changes. It's just the word we kind of use. As a dietitian, you might be interested or amused to know, we're actually thinking, should we change name for our profession? Because we don't want to be a food police. We're actually someone who can help people regulate relationship with food, whatever they might be and whatever they might present in more beneficial way. But being called dietitian, people always have that, you know, compulsion to tell me, I had chocolate yesterday. <laughs> so did I. That's okay. That's all right. So it's quite interesting. Yeah. So that's two things. Thank you for your work. And please don't um, treat diet as a kind of triggering negative word here. 
finally she'll start. So I come to you from Food and Mood Center. So we part of Impact Institute, School of Medicine, Deakin University. So we, it's on this photo, that's just some of us. We started about five years ago with, uh, um, by, with Professor Felice Jaka as our lead, lady in the front, in the pants and the both stand, that's Professor Felice Jaka. She started Food and Mood Center with a couple more researchers. Five years later, we are a multidisciplinary team of about 40. And we pioneering research in nutritional psychiatry. So that area of research and practice, which links diet and mental health. So our center research pro program spans across few areas. So we start with earlier life, then see what diet does to us along all our kind of life story or life stages. We, of course, focus on mental and brain health the most, and we run research in severe mental illness, in eating disorders, in PTSD, but we also look how other health behaviors, say physical activity or sleep, might impact our mental health we, of course, um, think about physical health as well. So, and I'll talk about biological dysregulation. So, gut health, inflammation, our kind of pet area is the gut health. And I'd be happy to come back and talk a little bit more about gut health with all of you. And we kind of run our investigations right, right from early life to see um, how even pre-life, pregnancy um, nutrition might impact mental health of offspring right to neurodegenerative disorders and cognitive decline, which comes with hopefully very healthy aging. So it's interesting to think about mental health treatment and prevention even 10, 15 years ago. So the idea that body and mind kind of together seldom came into treatment, let alone prevention. So treating, say, mental health or managing mental health through diet wouldn't be really quite a welcome or um, used idea in practice. And what we see, and hopefully through my presentation today, I'd be able to show you that the, um, that um, paradigm actually changing. We are see we view nutrition as essential part in management and in treatment of mental health disorders. So that area of nutritional psychiatry came to life just about five years ago with the establishment of International Society for Research in Nutritional Psychiatry, where quite a few researchers and practitioners working and practicing in mental health decided that we need to make a stand. We need to let world know that nutrition should be considered in the mainstream psychiatry. So with, with the establishment of um, nutritional psychiatry as a discipline, that's kind of how it's all started. So, but when we look at mental health in general, you would know that more than anybody else that of course there's many contributing factors which impact um, why people get mental health issues say like depression which we know of course is a leading cause of disability worldwide so over 25 percent after pandemic it's over 30 percent of all world disabilities actually attributed to mental health disorders and substance abuse disorders. And common mental health disorders such as depression and anxiety is the biggest part of it. So about 40 million of people live with depression and prevalence of anxiety, particularly after COVID is forever increasing, particularly in younger population. I don't know how many of you working with a younger population, anxiety absolutely everywhere. So when we look at mental health, there's complex determinants. There's, of course, genetics, say schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, we see clear genetic dis um, predisposition. There's biological factors, which I'm going to cover as well. Developmental factors such as trauma, social factors, 
environmental factors. So all of these factors which you can't really change in a hurry. You can try, but they might take some time. What's important, that's we understand that diet and other lifestyle factors, and again, diet doesn't mean, you know, slice of um, cucumber <laughs> and uh, kale leaves. So, but diet, the way you eat and other lifestyle factors are actually very strong players in the mix. And what's important about them, they are modifiable. Majority of us, not all, but majority of us on most days can make choices about our lifestyle. For some people, it might be more difficult or come with the barriers, and I will cover that later on in the presentation. But for majority, it's our choice. And we see that by making some changes in these lifestyle factors, we can actually achieve quite a nice outcomes in mental health as well. Let's have a look through diet and mental health across the life course. So I need to look sciencey. So I threw a few charts there for you to <laughs> kind of to like, oh yeah, she maybe knows what she's talking about, but I'm not gonna talk too much about charts. So I'll start with earlier life. And I mentioned before, we see that, oh no, that's not what I'm gonna start. Sorry, I was reshuffling my presentation <laughs> as I was sitting there. I'm not gonna start with earlier life. I'm going to start with earlier life in nutritional psychiatry, how it's all started. You know how I said as a discipline, we only established about six years ago. As a link between mental health and diet, one of the first publications only kind of saw light about 10, 11 years ago. So um, Felice Jaka then um, just post PhD conducted one of the first observational studies which actually look how dietary intake so everyday diet might impact um, depression in a smallish sample of women just over a thousand of them she and other researchers basically try to establish the correlation between mental health and between development of de novo depression and the habitual diet and what this study showed that Western diets, so when I say Western diets, it's diets based on ultra processed foods. And again, a little explanation here. In the modern society, majority of food we consume is of course processed to some extent. So when I say ultra processed foods, it's those foods when you know you kind of see it, but you don't know what that what that is, what it's made of, <laughs> what it's kind of, what that is. This is ultra processed food. So something you make at home, like you bake a cake, it's processing as well, but that's not what we call ultra processed food. So foods which come from deep fryer and you eat and you kind of pray it's chicken, you know, that's ultra processed <laughs> food. So, and this was one of the first diets showing that people who consume a lot of ultra processed foods have actually higher risks of developing depression. On another hand, people who consume more traditional diets, and again, you can call them whichever way, Mediterranean, Japanese, Scandinavian, um, plant-based, doesn't matter how you call them, but more traditional diets, which more based on whole foods, not on those ultra processed foods. They associated with decreased risk for developing depression. Kind of you think, well, probably logical. 10 years ago, it was a little bit groundbreaking. So the study went on to be published in the American Journal of Psychiatry and not just published dates, was like a, on the front page right there. So it's a big deal for psychiatrists any psychiatrists in the room? <laughs> Said with love. So for psychiatrists to admit that there's actually something else which might be impacting mental health. So after this study, this was a um, um, fair bit, I wouldn't say explosion, but fair bit of research conducted in different populations, in different foods, with different cuisines, 
related to also to different mental health outcomes, which are all roughly showing the same. The better your diet is, the less chances you have of developing mental health disorders and the more chances you have to recover from mental health disorders. We know that, for example, even before children are born, what their mother's eating will impact behavioral outcomes for years to come. And again, we usually present this information not to increase guilt all females, childbearing females carrying around in their life and not to, you know, to make mothers feel bad or worse, but to actually increase the knowledge that what you eat doesn't just impact physical health of kids. We see the mental health outcomes, cognition are often impacted as well. In younger children, we see, so when they're born, consumption, higher consumption of ultra-processed foods, also linked to externalizing behavior. In teenagers, when you say, well, teenagers, that horse is bolted. But again, <laughs> we, we see, I just went through kind of teenage years, so I know very well what <laughs> bolting horse looks like. So, <laughs> but in teenagers, we see as well, there's a clear link for kids who eat a little bit better. They seem to be just a little bit happy in life. So if their quality of life a little bit higher, their depression scores a little bit lower, cognition and also um, school work a little bit better as well. But also very interesting to see that largely these correlations, and I'm talking about observational studies, so that's correlational research. I'll talk about interventions later on. But at least in correlational research, we see that these in associations between mental health and diet are largely independent of socioeconomic status, of education, of body weight, which is very appealing message for community. Because look, I'm dietitian. I've been in this space for a while public health message about linking diet to say body size or just metabolic outcomes doesn't work, clearly doesn't work. So when we take the body weight out of this or body size, we see that as more inclusive message we can deliver to people. So it's not about how you look, it's not about you know isolating people or kids. When we go to school, we don't talk about diet and body size. We talk about diet and mental health outcomes and your happiness and ability to play sport or be engaged with other kids. So we see that it's very good message which works consistently with community. And it's come, we did not make it up. It came from research. So those correlations are largely independent. Remember how I said diet, you can call it many ways. So plant-based, again, don't have to be vegetarian. It's mean that a lot of stuff you eat has to be of plant origin. And it's not sugar. It's more other stuff because sugar is plant origin, of course, too. And people say, so what about sugar? Can we eat that? It's a plant origin. No, I'm talking about vegetables, fruits, legumes, beans, nuts, um, seeds, and grains. So whichever way you call the diet, Mediterranean, traditional, Japanese, Scandinavian, um, non-processed, or like here, diet with lower dietary inflammatory index, which is again, just a way we calculate in kind of diet quality. So whichever call, way you call better diets, they all see stable reduction of about 25 to 30% of um, risk development for depression. So majority of studies I kind of present today or we operate with are done in depression because it is a common mental health um, illness. And so a lot of it come from depression. It's most comorbid disorder, but we see a kind of similar outcomes in uh, limited studies done in other severe mental um, illness such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. So better food, better mental health outcomes. And as I mentioned before, 
across the life stages. For um, healthy cognition later in life, again, we see study which showing that um, better dietary intake means better cognition and less risk of developing frailty towards the end of life. Doesn't matter where cuisine is coming from, Brazil, Australia, UK, or Japan. So different cuisines, different ways of eating. Again, same denominator. So high consumption of fruit, vegetables, legumes, beans, nuts, seeds, grains, with a moderate consumption of protein, dairy or fish or meat, and a very low consumption of ultra-processed foods shows um, clear benefits for mental health. Summarized in this slide. <laughs> it's quite interesting that, again, not about guilt. I know we all enjoyed very nice streets there. So it's not about, you know, if you had, you know, croissant or sandwich or, I don't know, pizza for dinner, it doesn't mean that, you know, that's it. Your relationship with food is broken. No, it's mean that if you had, you know, a couple tomatoes yesterday, you scored. So we talk about that <laughs> consistent habitual intake. And that's sometimes when we also talk about changes, that's what's important to remember. It's not about all or nothing approach. It's not about I start on Monday and they're going to be absolutely perfect. It's about small changes to bring your habitual intake to a bit better level, basically. Slides reshuffling is not a good idea five minutes before presentation. Because I'm like, it's like, oh, a little bit, a bit of a surprise every time what's actually happening. I'll talk a little bit about biological um, dysregulation and comorbidities. So it's interesting that when we look at biological mechanisms which link um, mental health with diet, we can see that they quite complicated and interconnected and they explain actually how diet impacts mental health for example if we start i'm not going to go through all of them but just to tell you in general if we start this inflammation we see that um high proportion of people with mental health disorders have high inflammation it's even you know that idea of depression actually inflammatory disorder so when we unpack it a little bit and see where inflammation in the body coming from, again, the majority of factors which impact systemic inflammation are modifiable. So it's our level of physical activity, sleep, stress reduction, oral health, um, skin health, and diet as well, some of them. So again, remember it's for majority for pop of population. Individuals, of course, gonna vary. We see um, dietary interventions showing that inflammation can actually increase or decrease quite the systemic inflammation quite rapidly, uh, depending on your dietary style. Also, animal studies show us that um, inflammatory or inflammatory um, status of, of the body can increase quite rapidly without any other changes or so without body change, um, body weight changes, or blood sugar level changes as well. Then when we look, for example, at neurogenesis there on top as well, interesting to think that, again, about 20, 30 years ago, we thought that our body can't actually regenerate neurons, so brains can't regenerate new neurons. But now we know it's not quite true, and our body produces about 700 new neurons every day. So particularly, so our hippocampus, that's a kind of board, a part of our brain, which is responsible for that production or neurogenesis. Um, Sometimes English words still kind of battle me back when I try to say them. Um, and we also see that correlation between better dietary intake and a higher, say, BDNF production or brain-derived neurotropic factor that linking neuron, which is actually responsible for connectivity in our brain. Then we look, for example, at 
oxidative stress or that balance between um, oxidative, oxidative activity and antioxidant activities in our body. Again, we all heard 10 years ago, it was very popular, antioxidants. And yeah, the, the, the plant foods do have a lot of antioxidants. And we see that we actually need them. Our bodies need them too to combat that oxidative stress. Then if we look at gut microbiota, very fascinating area of research because it's kind of started to pick up in maybe last five years because with um, ability of us to analyze information because microbes, of course, very, very tiny, and that's a lot of them. So it's, they're not easy to analyze. Did you know, by the way, that you have trillions of microbes living on you and in you? You probably, yeah, you all know you uh, <laughs> medical professionals, but I like when I present to communities, I usually like to add here, because if you did notice, I fancy myself as a little bit comedian here. So I <laughs> Thank you for indulging me, by the way. So here I usually say, if you feel alone, don't, because there is literally trillions of microorganisms which live on and inside of human bodies, and they co-evolve with us. And now we understand, due to our understanding of um, gut brain axis, that bidirectional correlation between gut microbes and centers for emotion and cognition in our brain. We understand that a lot of mental health disorders could be viewed as that dysregulation of gut brain access. We also see consistently that in people living with mental health issues, we quite often see comorbid gut issue presentations. Heat with anxiety, they, you know, IBS anxiety goes hand to hand. We don't know yet enough what's chicken, what's egg, what starts first. And that's why we quite often talk about that, you know, core existence of microbes and hosts. So this is very interesting area as well of research. So when you look through several of these biological mechanisms, again, all of them are impacted by diet. All of them, we see similar correlation. Healthy diet, better. Western style diet, of course, worse. These biological, biological mechanisms also explain to us at least partially that high comorbidities or a high prevalence of say, physical disorders in people with mental health disorders. So you all know that majority of people living with mental health issues will have at least one comorbidity, often two, three, four. It seems to be the older person gets, the more comorbidities they have. Life expectancy of people living with severe mental illness is what, 16 to 25 years shorter than of those living without mental illness. Avoidable death, one third. It's interesting that for people um, going through, say, treatment for psychotic disorders or other severe mental illnesses, they often report that they forced to make a choice to either keep their mental health or physical health together. But one, one of them, they, sorry, they can't be together. It's got to be one of them. Yet we know that there are treatments and interventions which we can implement and which will work in this population. Then when I was trying to think and alcohol and other drugs is not obviously my, obviously my area of expertise. But when you think about the you know, presentations and challenges and presentations as a dietitian, I do understand challenges of, say, assessing someone who's a alcohol or drug dependent for nutritional deficiencies. So, but then when you think about comorbid presentation with mood and other disorders, with physical illness, that's why I think what you're doing is incredibly challenging, but also incredibly important. 
But also when you look at this comorbid presentation, hopefully you'll agree with me that pharmacological <laughs> approaches are insufficient to treat these um, comorbidities, multiple comorbidities. Majority of, say, um, medication address only one point where if we work with lifestyle, we're capable of addressing quite a few points. We also understand that, for example, if we work with diet, good dietary interventions are capable of building knowledge, skill, that self-efficacy, and a bit of self-love too in people, because that's what we see when people start to care about themselves, even with food. They kind of, it's a bit easier to love yourself. And food is also pretty good because everyone feels better about food. Everyone feels good talking about food. Everyone has some good food story. Everyone remembers birthday cake their mom made for them or something they ate last week. So food is an easy way to kind of get in and build this relationship as well. We understand that dietary treatment can support behavioral change, which then will make people resilient and less um, a decreased risk of relapsing. We also know that dietary treatment at least for common mental health disorders are cost effective. So I'll talk a little bit about um, diet and treatment. And first, I'd like to present to you the SMILES trial. We're all very proud of the SMILES trial conducted by the Food and Mood Center a few years ago. It was first randomized controlled trial, which actually used diet and dietary changes to improve clinical outcomes for individuals with um, severe depression. So we had, we enrolled 67 adults with depression. And again, it's not self-reported depression, it's people who were clinically diagnosed with severe depression, severe to moderate depression. And we enrolled them in, in our study and put them into two arms for 12 weeks. So, one arm went through dietary support, another arm went to social support or befriending. So our dietary support was based on modified Mediterranean diet. So it was designed and developed by our wonderful dietitian, Dr. Rochelle Opie. It was based on Mediterranean diet, but of course, adjusted for Australian consumers, for Australian conditions. For example, in Mediterranean diet, we'll know that traditionally consumption of red meat is very low. It's like once a month, once in a few months. If we do that to Aussies, there's going to be riots, of course. So <laughs> we kept a fair bit of red meat in the diet. So we did use individual approach. And we see that consistently from the literature that we need to have people one-on-one. -on -one. Some group approach is good. It's very cost-effective. Peer support works as well. But particularly for challenging cases, one-on-one -on -one with a specialist is essential. And that modification included simple but consistent message. So we did not make people into master chefs. We understand that people who come in with issues would not have abilities or skills or time or motivation to cook. So I'll talk a little bit more um, what kind of foods we recommended, but I'll just thought I'll unpack the general principles here of the Modimed diet. So very close to traditional Mediterranean diet based on consumption of whole grains with vegetable, fruit, dairy, and uh, proteins. We recommended people to start consuming legumes if they haven't. Legumes are wonderful. I can talk about legumes nonstop. They're fantastic, they're cheap, and they're cheerful, and they're very good for you. So we encourage people to start consuming legumes. We also encourage olive oil, particularly um, extra virgin olive oil, as the main source of fat. So in cooking, in salads, on everything, olive oil. We um, ask people to eat nuts. We ask people to reduce consumption 
of red meat, because although we kept about four serves of red meat, but serve is about palm size. So if you like and like me have gigantic hands, you probably can have a bit more red meat. <laughs> Unfortunately for my hands, I'm vegetarian, so it doesn't, doesn't work, but that's kind of easy way to see how much protein you probably need. So we also encourage people to consume oily fish. And most importantly, we ask people to decrease consumption of ultra processed foods, which we kind of call extras and put them right on top. And we ask people to reduce consumption to about three per week. So people came in, we're consuming 15 a day. We ask them to reduce to three per week. Not easy, but doable. Again, if you look at Mediterranean diet, that um, consumption of everything, basically, you can enjoy as much food as you want. You can eat whatever you like, long as it's from this pyramid. If you like yogurt with honey, please do so. You like nuts with honey, again, to reduce that um, cravings for sweeter food. So use a lot of honey, use a lot of fruit. For salty foods, Mediterranean diet, olives, fantastic. You use a bit of bread, eat bread. Please don't stop eating bread. So we never focus with this specific diet. We never focus on physical outcomes. It was all about mental health outcomes. So this is kind of support material we provided our participants with. And so we talk about what kind of what to use and what to put together. So simple kind of cheat sheets. So if you have simple protein, doesn't have to be anything fancy, it could be a can of fish with a bit of um, grains or vegetables, so crackers or rice or chickpeas, and then throw a bit more vegetables on top. Frozen vegetables, okay. Canned vegetables, absolutely okay too. That's quite sometimes is a barrier for people because they say, I don't have time to cook. I don't have time to buy fresh vegetables. You don't have to. So it doesn't have to be something grown in, in Alps, you know, with <laughs> organic kind of water and stuff like this. It doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't take all that much to start making changes for the better. So this is one of the educational resources or knowledge resources we provided our participants. So 12 weeks, look what happened. 33% of our dietary arm achieved remission. So 12 weeks and they no longer were classified as clinically depressed. So social support worked as well. So 8% of in social group also increased their kind of mental health. And they, of course, they felt supported with befriending protocol, but coming and seeing researchers and talking about their life always will. Yeah, people always appreciate when someone listens to them. So that's why we saw social support worked as well. But died 32% in remission after 12 weeks. So after this, we also conducted economic evaluation, again, to show that healthier diets don't cost more. Marketing companies would like you to think so, because if you walk in and you see activated nuts for $29.95, <laughs> why you need them, no one knows. So, but basically, we conducted um, individual analysis of foods based on costed seven day food diaries. And we saw that before people came into our intervention, they spent about $138 per week. So it's metropolitan Melbourne about five years ago. When we costed recommended diet, it would cost about $112 per week. Again, that's remember we do ask people to kind of plan, prepare, care for their food and cook where they can. We also done economic evaluation from the healthcare utilization perspective and also from unpaid productivity. And this evaluation showed that compared to social support condition, dietary support, the average total 
health sector cost was um, $850 lower and average societal cost were two and a half thousand lower. Again, I don't have time to go into other trials which came after SMILES based on group work, based on online work, but they show similar, very promising outcomes and cost effectiveness is there as well. We have meta-analytical level data. So it's when we combine a lot of studies together, of course, that showing us that dietary interventions, at least in depressions, at least in females are quite effective. Females are always a bit more responsive to lifestyle changes, particularly to diet, whereas with smiles, we see a bit more response in physical activity. So we, yeah, so it's mixed finding for anxiety. And I think it's largely because anxiety does come a lot with gut issues. And then there's a, might be another way around of treating it. And currently we are running trial on um, gut-related anxiety and depression and how dietary changes can help gut issues and mental health issues as well. So this data is coming. So this um, took a bit of convincing, but the level of evidence actually affords um, our Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatry to recommend diet along with other lifestyle changes such as sleep hygiene and regular exercise as step one in treatment for major depression. So step one, non-negotiable action plan for depression is lifestyle. Is it happening? Probably not. There's few issues to it, but this is what in guidelines right now. Before we try medication, before we try psychotherapy. So regulation of lifestyle. Of course, if everyone would do what we kind of asked them to do, and if we all knew how to eat well and go follow recommendations, we probably, I wouldn't be having this discussion with you right now. Particularly in people with mental health issues, implementing dietary changes always come with a lot of challenges. And this is just an extract from actual recommendation showing again that helpful diet is flexible, sustainable, and characterized by this high intake of whole foods. So grains, legumes, vegetables, fruit, nuts, with a lower intake of ultra processed foods. Here it's also, um, kind of talking about olive oil and alcohol in modest quantities. One to two standard drinks per day. For males and one for females, not all that much. Of course, when it comes to implementation, that's where difficulties are. And that's where I would love to plug in um, dietitian. So in Australia, there's only one profession which is trained to implement nutrition in clinical settings. So Australia, in Australia, it's accredited practicing dietitian. So we have about five to, hard to, hard to count, about five to 6,000 of us. We're accredited, we go through rigorous training at least four years and up then another year of supervised kind of work. We also undergo accreditation everywhere, every year. So we need to have our professional development. And if you want to refer to us, you can find us at Dietitians Australia. We continuously advocate for inclusion of Medicare items for individuals with severe mental health issues, but it's yet to happen. It would happen soon. One day we do have item for eating disorders, at least. With severe mental illness, it's a little bit different story. So dietitians work with a range of consumers and, and clients. And for even most severe disorders, there is things dietitians can do. So this one of the studies which was conducted 
based on healthy med approach and healthy med style, um, a healthy med trial, it was kind of group based trials similar to smiles, which used changes in diet to, to see if we see any mental health outcomes. It worked in people with depression. So this trial then ran a bit of a pilot study in rehab center where a uh, majority of patients had some kind of form of psychosis. So either schizophrenia or other form of psychosis. And this particular study showed that just three months of working with people improve um, their understanding of the diet, um, improve in knowledge and skills and the ability to start making changes in the diet, a reduction in poor nutrition habits. And here it's important to note that, look, it can come, dietary modifications can come in different ways. For some people consuming one liter of um, Coca-Cola a day instead of five, it's a great improvement yeah. for someone just to eat something every now and then a sandwich or anything or I don't know fried chicken anything is a great improvement so for all of us we all can make improvement and our consumers and patients of course can make improvements as well and what's important here which I continue to kind of draw your attention to that Diet is fantastic way of developing those independent living skills as well. When people start to care for themselves, usually wonderful things happen. There's few centers in Australia who pioneer this application of kind of lifestyle medicine. So keeping body and mind program, I'm not sure how much you know about them. They work in New South Wales, but they kind of spread in the message everywhere. It's more for people with intellectual disabilities, with psychosis, and this program is focused on improving cardiometabolic outcomes. We know that when kids say first presentation with psychosis, if people, kids need to start on medication for psychosis, first year, usually they put on about 20 kilograms, of course. With 20 kilograms come all the worsening of other metabolic outcomes, which is very hard to reverse. If we see, if we start implementing lifestyle program right at the start of introduction of medication for psychosis, we definitely reduce, <coughs> we definitely can reduce the metabolic outcome, um, metabolic health risks. Another program is coming to you from Sunshine Coast or my heartland, the land of Kabi Kabi people. And there again, um, wonderful team working in a community care unit. Majority of patients there are schizophrenic. They develop um, aim self-capacity intervention model. It's got four big pillars and additional eight little ones. And why I show you this program, it's because this is wonderful example how you can do make a difference and run a program on the smell of oil Iraq, basically, because they are utilizing everything around them. They don't have fundings, they, they have don't have enough of support even and resources, but they made it work. So this program is fantastic. There's a team, very motivated team of people who are willing to help their patients. And they look, all of them are trained in kind of motivational interviewing. And all of them, all staff participates in program as much as actual consumers, as much as patients. So they play sport together. They go in the shops together. They cook together. They grow vegetables together. They plan their meals they cook their meals that's they kind of um <laughs> that's what they call psychoanalysis <laughs> because they found that of course um buying meals might be quite costly but if they all cook together they freeze the meals it's actually good for everyone and it's quite cheap and they do call that psychoanalysis <laughs> so we actually published um recently if you want to read up on this program a little bit more. 
Um, so, look, I thought I'll touch a little bit, so maybe you invite me again to talk a little bit more about stuff. I thought I'll talk about novel treatments and diet and gut targeted interventions, because that's usually something very interesting. I feel that, look, it's a fascinating area of research, but it's a little bit kind of privileged area of research. 10 minutes, oh my God, I keep talking. Yeah, I'm gonna wrap up. So, but it's quite interesting that that kind of shows you that gut brain connection, because by changing different aspects of diet related kind of factors, we can potentially impact mental health outcomes. So happy to come back and talk a little bit about that. So I'll just talk very quickly about issues and in implementation, and hopefully it would help you to see how what I'm talking about here today might be applicable in your work or in your life. So of course, we understand that there's a lot of barriers in implementation of lifestyle changes. You don't have to have severe mental illness or drug addiction to understand that it's not easy. There's um, a lot of issues, fatigue, behavioral, motivational issues. We're all busy. We're all so, so busy. We just don't have time to take care of ourselves usually. So that's what usually people say. I'm so busy. So of course, when we have, when it's compounded by addiction or some kind of other mental health issues, it's become very, very difficult. So from consumer perspective though, consumers continuously telling us that they don't like that narrow focus on their diagnosis. So this comes from kind of horse's mouth from consumers and um, it's a group I had the privilege to work with as part of being Equally Well project. And here for consumers and care's perspective, they saying that this narrow focus on mental illness actually doesn't help them. So consumers do want to have more integrated approach. But they did mention, of course, discrimination and stigma and economic barriers and lack of service integration, which we all know how people just fall through the cracks and um, lack of peer support also um, lack of choices and control over their kind of way of recovering and their way of treatment. So to talk about implementing that, there's quite a few things, of course, we as practitioners need to know. So we need to understand psychoeducation and counseling and nutritional aspects of psychoeducation and counseling. We also need to be known judgmental and quite empathetic to get people on the same page with us and collaboration and multidisciplinary approach, of course, very important. So I'm just trying to, again, to make sure that you refer to dietitians every time you can. So to implement something, of course, we need to have people and practitioners who are willing, able and ready. So if you're not ready or not willing or um, not able, that's okay as well. So we usually, if you don't know where to start, I think it's a good idea to start talking about food, regardless of what kind of presentation you might be dealing with. It's might be, you know, when, <laughs> when people present, I'm sorry, I'm not laughing about this. I'm just thinking how much we actually want out of mental health workers to do. So when someone presents to you in some, some kind of severe state, you're probably not gonna ask them about what they usually eating or not eating. So it's all about timing and I'll cover that on each um, next slide, but you could start with just asking what people actually thinking about food and have they eaten at all today? Do they have anyone to eat with? So what, what's food for them all together? Just to get this conversation going. We can use all the different tools and see how we can say, use um, th this trans theoretical model to understand where people at and depending. So you, you might have, we hear stories about chefs with drug addictions who, who were able to overcome their addiction and become awesome chefs. So you never know your next patient might be future chef. So you need to ask and see. 
And when we talk about, that's why I'm talking about timing. So pe some people might not be ready, some people might be ready and waiting. Making your people center of attention when you're talking about this is always very important as well. And focusing on these small kind of uh, steps for a long road. When I think about this or when I put this framework together, I was thinking about my own teenager and how difficult it is to kind of address any, any changes here. So small steps, being a motivator, motivating people, believing in them, believing that you can help them and they can change as well, addressing their barriers and making sure that it's never kind of, you never leave that without, without follow-up. So if you decide to kind of start with someone and talk about their diet, make sure you kind of follow up to deliver that consistent approach. I'm not gonna worry about overcoming, overcoming the challenges right now. I just wanna tell you about a couple of resources. So there are quite a few resources which you can start using in your profession, but also to refer patients to. So Head to Health is pretty easy, pretty accessible resource. Also Food and Mood Center, of course, have our own site. We have a few trials running, which you probably can refer your patients to. We also have online course. This is something quite open uh, clinicians refer their patients to, and then I get lovely emails from people saying that they completed the course and how um, helpful it's actually been for them. And we do have about 75,000 enrollees from all over the world in this course, and it's free and online. We also um, next year going to offer some postgraduate level training. So if you're interested in that, get in touch with me. And one thing what I wanted to kind of finish off that we need to remember that it doesn't have to be perfect to be good. In that smile trial where we see, where we saw fantastic changes, the biggest benefit came from small reductions in consumption of ultra processed foods. So life is long road. It never have to be perfect, and diet is just one aspect of it. And we deal when we deal with this in our everyday life, it makes it very challenging. But change is possible, of course, and we know that for humans, recovery is that feeling of hope and healing and empowerment and connection. And food is fantastic way to get in and to make people feel better. Thank you very much for having me here today um, and indulging my capacity to be a stand-up comic here. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Adriana, have we got time for a couple of questions? Yeah, yeah. I've just got one, which is <laughs> get out there. I, I was just interested to know that my husband's a my husband's a canola breeder and I was really interested to see that you're really pushing the olive oil mm -hmm. considering that canola's got the omega-3 fatty acids and mm -hmm. then saying later on people needed to take the fatty acids. So is there a reason why you're not then promoting canola oil? But not, enough, <laughs> not enough research in canola oil, okay, so, that's all. Yeah. So everything what I present is evidence-based, so yeah. we just need more research. Okay, so I'll tell him to do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, particularly with people starting a new diet um, I think of a lot of the alcohol clients who pretty much eat nothing and mainly drink is there any risk for starting a new diet particularly with things like refeeding syndrome yep yeah, yes yeah. so look refeeding syndrome I know refeeding syndrome very well but I look through the lens of eating disorders and research refeeding syndrome a lot there so Usually the approach to avoid refeeding syndrome is to start low. So slow and in increase in increments um, to, to you know, increase energy intake, basically. But interesting what we see, say, in eating disorder and restrictive eating disorder presentation, which it's kind of similar minus the alcohol addiction that 
starting slow actually decreases recovery process. So right now we in eating disorders and restrictive eating disorders, we use more assertive protocol and research show us no real impact on the risk of refeeding syndrome. But that's why, you know, working in multidisciplinary team and being able to draw on, you know, on resources from all practitioners in the team probably will help me make a decision, help you make a decision on how to start. Can I just make a comment? I love the fact that you brought up about gut health because mm. I've always been a believer in gut health and you've just confirmed Yep, 100%. Um, what I think, and I'm going to incorporate, I've taken, I hope you don't mind, I've taken a few photocopies so that I can implement some diet mm -hmm. um, suggestions for my um, clients who come for drug and alcohol withdrawal mm -hmm. and stuff because, you know, um, it's awesome. I love it. Thank yep. you. Yeah, I'm happy to come back and unpack gut conditions and, you know, diet. And yeah, because we see it's a very strong presentation with gut issues and mental health issues. That's where, where I'm talking about gut brain access. Mm -hmm. A lot of mental health disorders are coming from this dysregulation in the access. Now, we do have a couple of questions from Zoom as well. The first one is questioning whether multi strain probiotics improve mental health. And I don't know yeah. what I'm asking. Yeah, no, that's all right. That's, uh, that's, I'm, I'm smiling because I always get asked about probiotics and I usually cover them together with gut health. So, probiotics, of course, are live bacteria which we can consume in supplements. If it's multi-strain, we usually talk about supplements, we can consume for the, in supplements and they should confer some health benefits. So probiotics are a little bit challenging because if you can imagine someone on a parachute trying to land in a rainforest, your gut is essentially rainforest where all the tree flora and fauna is bacteria, your residential bacteria and fungi happily coexisting there. And then you have multi-strain or single strain probiotic, which like a parachute landing into this rainforest. Might be okay, might get swept away in the river, might get stuck in, in a tree somewhere, might get eaten by a tiger. That's essentially how probiotics are. That's how they are because you introduce bacteria into establish whether it's well-functioning or not well-functioning, but establish microbiome. So we see that research is kind of inconsistent. We do know that majority of probiotics work to some extent in majority of people, but for whom, in which doses, in which strains, we just don't have enough evidence there. Excellent, thank you. And there's just a couple more too, there's quite a few. So this one's actually a left fielder as well. Um, yep. Fecal transplant to address <laughs> mental health issues. Yep. Is it on the cards? Absolutely, <laughs> Big, it's actually happening. So FMT or um, fecal microbial transplant, that's a way of trying to change gut microbiota composition in in way to impact mental health function. So funny enough, FMT is actually first being covered in traditional Chinese medicine, I think 1400 years ago. So it's called yellow soup and it was used in treatment of severe gastro issues. So I don't know if it's been used in mental health, but it's been used to treat severe gut issues. We see application of FMT in treatment of colitis, quite successful application. So right now, FMT is a developing area of treatment. We have FMT banks, which are highly regulated. It's like a blood bank kind of level of regulation but we see successful treatment or application of FMT in cancer, in colitis, and 
in some of severe mental illness. It's still only case studies and pilot studies in eating disorders. But we actually in our center doing um, one next year too. We call them lovingly crapules, and that's what we're doing. We're doing FMT trials, so I'll be able to present results end of next year. Excellent, thank you. And I guess the last piece was whether or not you'd be willing for one of us to pass on your contact details for further. Absolutely, yep, yep. Find me on socials, on um, Twitter, easiest way, Tatiana Rocks, or just email me at tatiana.rocks at deacon.edu.au. And I'll put that in the Zoom chat as well. Yeah, absolutely, yep. no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some conference talking about poo at the end of it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> we'll do it. That's it. I'll be quick and I'll just say because I know it's you know it's nice to get it on time. It's been our third time lucky to get here. I can remember standing there with Scott and Julia, and I reckon it was nearly a year ago. You know, <laughs> looking at the room, and we've been through several program changes. Um, interesting meetings since then. Number caps, but we finally got here. So. I just wanted to say thanks to all the people who are involved in the conference planning. We had a small forum planning. We had a small committee to do that, who again, went through several changes of speakers and contingency plans, and especially Scott and Julia, who I know have done a body of work to get this event off the ground. Um, all the speakers as well, just wanted to say thank you for giving their time and Endeavour, of course, for putting on fantastic lunch. We always appreciate it. That's quite blunt, right? I'm here on behalf of Dana, so I just wanted to say jump on our website to look for memberships. But we're now that we're open again, we're conferencing again in Adelaide next year in August. So if anyone wants to join us, we'd be happy to have you there at Glenelg on the beach. It'll be fantastic. We also have a nurse practitioner forum day. So any nurse practitioners or aspiring nurse practitioners, be great to see you there. And I just wanted to say, I'm hoping we can continue this ongoing partnership with VADA. It's been fantastic and that we can run events like this again. Finally, thank you all for coming. I know it's really difficult at the moment with what's going on out in the real world of health services. So we do appreciate that you've taken time out of your busy work lives to join us. Thank you. Safe travels home if you've come from a distance.